We'll have a few minutes at the end. For some of you, you might be just especially thankful either to God or somebody that you'd like to just give thanks for. So we'll, we'll try to save a few minutes at the end for you to do that. Um, it looks like I got about 43 minutes. I've asked Mary Jo in a minute to come and share uh, some things. You know, we've been talking about family. And you know, the last couple of weeks we've had people up here share. And it's like last week when Dan and Laura shared. Afterwards, different ones of you said, you know, I feel like my heart is knitted to them. Connected. That's what it's all about, connecting. We are family. And uh, very emotional. After last week, you understand why we put Kleenex boxes under the chairs so you have access to those. Uh, we're family. And God is desiring, he wants us to be more and more conscious of this. Every church talks about family. But honest to goodness, I don't think there's a church anywhere that I know of that we are more family than, than, than we are here. Um, just as a refresher, we've been talking about commitments. The three-legged stool, where is that? Visuals are always good. And um, I, I wish I knew where this came from. We've had it for years. You know what it is. It's a milk stool, right? And uh, if you would try to milk a cow with one of these three legs missing, that'd be quite a challenge. <clears throat> if you try to live life without the three essentials, you're going to have a hard time. What are they? Commitment to the Word of God, commitment to prayer, and commitment to the family of God. All three of those are so essential. I want to read for you. <coughs> you know, last week we, every once in a while, we'll have a uh, lunch after church for those that are new or relatively new to Grace Church. And we always give them a sheet of paper to fill out. And we ask them why they came the first time and why the second time. And uh, I just want to read for you, and it's in your bulletin too, <coughs> some of the comments. Why they came back the second time. I connected. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? I connected. I like the worship, music, and the message. I like Pastor Rogers' preaching. No, that's not in there. <laughs> teachings, well, teachings from God's word and the friendly welcome. Love, hospitality, presence of God. Our family like the people and the pastors. Everyone was so nice. You preached the Bible. Personal struggles and a need to change. I never expected a congregation that was such a family and so accepting and loving. I felt like the people I've been looking for. The oneness with the pastors and a true Bible teaching church. Everyone was so welcoming. I really liked the energy and the people you felt God. Invited back again and willingly accepted. It felt like the church was alive. Kids church, exclamation mark. Nice people and made friends easy. Those, when I read that as a pastor, that just blesses my heart. Because they are commending you for being welcoming. And folks... I know we're short on chairs, but we, we can't quit inviting people in and making people feel welcome. Some of you might, at some point, until we get another building, of course we have room still in the overflow, there might be times when we ask some of you young people that are here regularly to stand in the back or something, to give up your seats. But we want to keep on growing. You know, Casey Hellbach, who ran for the, what was it, the 127th district, uh, I mentioned this to some of you, he, when, when I was talking to him last week, he said during the campaign, for 30 weeks, he visited a different church each week, 30 churches. And here's what he said on the phone when he was talking to me. He said, I visited 30 churches in 30 weeks, and Grace Church was the most welcoming and where he felt the most at home. Now that's a wonderful statement. I'm bragging on you guys. I'm really boasting on the Lord, what he is doing in you and through you, allowing him to live and love through you. Because that's exactly what Jesus, if he was at the door welcoming people, that's what they would feel. They would get these kind of responses. Well, I've asked Mary Jo to come. <clears throat> come on up here, Mary Jo. Most of you know Mary Jo. She's one of my favorite people. And I mean <laughs> that. You really are. And uh, she loves God, and she has grown so much. Um, so th here's what I want to do. I want to continue to have different ones share. You know, in the first church, it wasn't, we all came, they all came together and just worshiped, and then the pastor preached. Unless it was Paul, he preached for two hours so long or whatever it was all night, and they'd fell out the window. You remember that story? <clears throat> but um, different ones shared different things. And we have a lot of that here, and I want to see more of that. And so, again, hopefully, 
depending on how long Mary Jo takes and how long I take, uh, you'll have some time to share today, if not today. But it, already some of you have said, you know, I'd like to share my story. We went through the Bible, the story, right? And every one of us has a story. And I know many of your stories. But I, whenever every, any one of you shares, I always get some things that I didn't know. And it's such a blessing to see what God has done and is doing and what you expect him to be doing. And so if you would like to get on the list, I've already got somebody lined up next week that you're going to enjoy very much. <clears throat> and so, um, family, in what way has Grace Church, the Grace Church family, been a family to you? There's so many facets to that. And we'll talk a little bit about that after Mary Jo. Now, I, don't, I didn't say any of that to rush you. I'm serious. I want you to take it. You don't feel rushed. Okay. And I, we, they couldn't get that. Did you get that picture of my sister up there? In the sound booth? Did that, that picture come through? Well, you don't have to do it yet, but when she, when she gives, you the, gives you the word, okay? Okay, well, it's an honor to be up here, and, uh, and I thank God for the family of Christ. And <laughs> one thing I want to say is that God never gives up on us. He never does, and he really does love us, and he will chase us down, and I'm glad for that. And then on a happier note, I love the song, We Are the Family. I got all my brothers and sisters with me. <laughs> and I, I, I think that would be a really good song to sing. I love to dance. And I do have my real sister right there, Christine Hansen, who I love. And I'm so glad that God, you know, we're family, but this family too. And she's part of this family. So, oh, but you know, when I first came to Grace, I really had a hard struggle to come. I was saved, but I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit, but I knew I hated my life and I needed help. And I knew I needed more help than what was available so far to me. So I, um, that morning I went out with a neighbor, Sue Olstead, and it was 1995 in August, and we were garage selling in New Glarus. And uh, Susie was very friendly, and she said, oh, look, look over there. There, there it was. The garage door was open, and un yep, unbeknownst to me, Pastor Roger and his daughter Sherry were in here, and they were making a float. And she goes, look, they have books. And I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go over there. I don't even know who they are. But in my heart, I had cried out to the Lord that I wanted more of him, and I wanted to have the same kind of experience they had in the New Testament and so anyway we went over and I met Pastor Roger and I I remember looking at his eyes and I just knew that he loved the Lord I could feel that love and uh, Sherry too and so anyway I told him I started talking and then he goes yeah you remind me of Lana from New York because you have that accent and I'm like I didn't know who Lana was but it's funny Lana's here today God brings us back doesn't he and then, um, so anyway, um, I said, I need this book, This Present Darkness. And I thought, he, there's no way they're going to have this book. And well, he had the book. And I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. So I got the book. I told him I really wanted to come back, but it took me six months to come back. And there was a battle. There was a spiritual battle going on. And uh, Satan did not want me to come. And so um, I started reading the book, and uh, it opened up my eyes because I didn't realize that there was a lot of things going on in the spiritual realm, and I, I asked God to give me faith so I could believe. But um, I did have a, a scary moment in the, in the middle of the night, and uh, it was a demonic attack, and I couldn't breathe. And I remember screaming out at the top of my lungs, Jesus! And I woke my husband up, and he, he just said, he didn't know what was going on, and then he just said, well, what are you reading? Don't read that. And I'm like, yeah, no way. I'm not reading that. That's too scary. I'm not going to read that book. And so I kept thinking, and then I heard the Lord say, greater is he that is within me than he that is of the Lord. And I thought, I tried to find that verse, and I didn't think, I couldn't find it, but th it is in the Bible. And then I decided and I needed to go. So I called Susie up, who's my neighbor, who said, if you want to go, I'll go with you. So I called her up and I said, Susie, you want to go to church? And she goes, well, it certainly sounds like you don't want to go. And I said, I don't. I don't want to go, <laughs> but I know I have to go. And I was fighting with the Lord, and um, she said, okay, I'll pick you up. And so she picks me up, and we're driving, and she goes, 
what is the matter with you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm nervous. I was really afraid. I, I said, don't you tell them anything about me. I said, I, you know, don't tell them anything. And she goes, Mary Jo, Mary Jo, don't worry. They're going to love you with open arms. And I'm like, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> so anyway, I was a little nervous. I was scared, fearful, and I had labels. And I didn't want people to judge me. And I figured that you would be judged if I came here. So came to Grace. Of course, it, was, it used to be here. But then, of course, by the time I got here, they moved over to the high school. So we... If Susie wasn't with me, I don't think I'd ever make it because that was too much. Because you just move anything and then I'm done. That, I'm not going. So we went. And so we were in there. And the worship was going. And then Susie go. I noticed that um, you could feel the love of God. But I noticed that Su there was people in the back praying. No, they were in the front praying. And I thought, wow, you, you can come and get prayed for if you had a problem before church even started. I thought that was good. She goes, well, are you going to get prayed for? I go, are you kidding? I'm just watching. I go, the minute they do anything weird, I am out of here. <laughs> it's serious, because I didn't know what that charismatic meant, you know. And Grace Church, you know, and then I didn't know what non-denominational charismatic. That's what it said in the phone book back then. And uh, Pastor Roger said a couple of years after when I shared my testimony, um, he said, Mary Jo, we never did anything weird till you came. <laughs> and that is true. <laughs> no. Oh my goodness. So 1996, this February, will be 23 years ago. I came in, I was afraid. I knew that um, I, had, I had a crutch, I had, I had issues. I cried out to the Lord, I wanted more. I wanted more of the Lord. So, um, okay, well. Yesterday, I just want to say I am so proud of the ladies, of the ladies. Yesterday, the vulnerability, sharing their testimony. There is nothing greater than a testimony, okay? And sometimes it's hard to share the, the dirty laundry and the different things that we have done. But none of us, none of us are without sin. All of us have issues. So, um, so I, okay, so I'm a recovered alcoholic. I have been sober for 26 years now. And, uh, but I, thank you. And that's, that's from the grace of God because I would have, should have been dead. But I still smoked pot. I did, I smoked pot to calm me down. I just needed a couple of hits. And so I actually smoked pot before I came because I was so nervous about coming here. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it's. But I have to tell you, the good news is that God delivered me. Now, did we talk about, we sang today about chain breaker and that God delivers us? I didn't like that I did. I, I smoked since I was in ninth grade. I didn't like it. It was an addiction. And, um, but I needed it. That's what I thought. It was a crutch. And so um, anyway, I said to the Lord, there's no verse in the Bible that says you can't smoke pot. And it says... <laughs> said, you gave us all green-bearing seed, use it as meat. <laughs> well, you, can't out, you cannot argue with God. <laughs> I said, just show me where it is. And so one day he told me to go to Romans 14, 22. And I read it. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. I'm thinking, huh. Am I condemning myself? Because, yeah, I was, because I was a hypocrite. I was going to go to church, but meanwhile, I wasn't really living for the Lord because I didn't give him everything. I knew that much. I knew that I was bought with a price, and I wasn't my own, and I had to give up certain things. But, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, or he smokes pot, or if he drinks, or if he is a gossiper, because his eating or whatever it is, is not from faith. Because I said, God, it says eating. He goes, it doesn't matter what it says. It's what are, what are you doing? You're partaking into something that's not right. And it, for you, if you're condemned in your spirit, and I was. Then he said, everything that does not come from faith is sin. Oh, that meant that I was a sinner. I thought, okay, God, I need your help. And he said, yes, Mary Jo, trust me. And I remember right shortly after that, Pastor Roger telling the story about a monkey having the treat in a vase and wouldn't let go, wouldn't let go because couldn't get his hand out, but he didn't want to lose the treat. And that was me. I didn't want to lose it because I didn't know what it was like to be straight and sober and clean. 
And so um, I was holding on to that treat, that cheese or that, and he said, Mary Jo, just let go and I'll bless your socks off. And you know, he delivered me from smoking pot and I have not smoked pot since. And I'm so thankful because I didn't realize, yeah, so he could set you free. <laughs> you know, I was in deception and I didn't know I was. You know, when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. And it's so, it's a cloud. It's a foggy, awful place to be. So it took a long time for me to get healed. And I was just saying to somebody today, you know, the prayer time at church before, if you have, if you have a need, they still do that in the back. Go and get prayed for because it is so powerful. Prayer is powerful. And um, so, um, let's see. Um, Okay, thank you, Lord. I need help. I just lost it. Prayer is so powerful that um, if it, I wouldn't be here if it, well, here, I just remember my sister praying for me for many, many years, too, and I thank God for that. So, um, oh, I, I just wanted to, to say that when I came to Grace Church, I, I didn't, I, it took me a long, that's what I was going to say, I cried and cried and cried during worship all the time, you know, and that's why it's the tissue church, you know, I mean, we have tissues everywhere, and I'm so glad, but then afterwards they go, let's shake hands and welcome everybody, and I'm like, so snotty and everything, I'm like, go away, <laughs> but I'm, 23 years later, I still cry, but not as much as I did, because God is good, and he's healed me, so liquid tears, those are good things, if you're crying during worship, God's healing your heart. It's so important. So anyway, so then the first thing I did was I got connected in a small group. And I have to say, I thank God for that because I couldn't even live from Sunday to Wednesday, Sunday to Wednesday. And Pastor Carol was here, and she is so, such a, uh, I just thank God for Pastor Carol. I miss her so much, but what a treasure she was to us women. And um, I have to say that she was a spiritual mother to me, and I learned so much. And she took me and others under her wings. And um, we had the ladies' discipleship class, and we would meet, and we would grow, and we were vulnerable, and we got prayed for. And it was great, and it was many years. And uh, I always believed in getting in a, in a cell group, and I remember um, after that time, Pastor Roger, they, they, Mike DeWitt started one, and I thought, well, I, I'm a rug hooker, and I didn't think that God could use rug hooking, but um, Pastor Roger's mom was a rug hooker, and so I got to know her, and then they said, yeah, I said, well, I'd give this up, because I figured, you know, I have a tendency to stay on one road and then get on to the other road, so then I'm going to give everything up, and God said, no, I could use rug hooking, so I didn't think he could, and, I, and Pastor Roger told me that I could, so I had, my first cell group was called Rug Hooking Soul Sisters. <laughs> And we had it in here. I mean, I'm dating myself, man. <laughs> but it was good. It reached out to the, to the, um, the community. Okay, so. Um, um, Karen Fredrickson and, and Pastor Carol and the group that we met with. And then I met with Lori Wirtz. And um, all through the years, I've been friends with Lori. And she's stuck with me thick and thin. And I thank God for that. I needed... You need to get connected. You need to get into a small group because that's where you really get to meet people and you get prayed for and you can talk about your needs. And the thing about it is you're only as sick as your secrets. And I, heard, I learned that in um, Celebrate Recovery. And believe me, I, was, I had secrets. And so I was very afraid. But I think that it's so important to be vulnerable and to share your testimony because that's how we overcome. And when we bring the secrets out into the light, that's when we get set free. So um, oh, let's see. Where can I begin? This family, they accepted me. I was labeled. I was divorced, an alcoholic, and, and a drug addict. And you know what? They loved me. And I told everybody my story. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't keep my mouth shut because God set me free. And I was so excited. And, you know, I remember Pastor Carol told me, and then after I would share, and I'd go home, and I'd feel really bad. You know, my husband didn't come to church, so I'd, I had that issue, too. So I know what it's like to, uh, to be single, uh, well, to be married and not have your husband here. And it, it's hard, believe me. So if I can encourage you, just hang in there. It, God will answer your prayer. But I just remember Carol told me, Mary Jo, it's very important to share your story. Someone may need to hear it, even just one person, and that's what God would do. One person. 
And the story is be for the what I want you to know is that fear is from the enemy, and he wants God wants to set you free, and the enemy wants to keep us so bound. And so by getting connected in the body and getting into small groups, then you get this relationship, and then you feel more comfortable. And and because of all the different things that I was involved in, that when the when you know trouble will come, and when it does come. That's when you really need your family, and that's when you know you have a family. Because my husband got diagnosed with prostate cancer in 08. He passed away, but um, there was like three years when he was really sick. And if it wasn't for the body of Christ, I couldn't have done it because I had hospice care there, and um, they would come over. Some some of the ladies would come over and relieve me so that I could go to the dentist and that I could get out and go food shopping and. Um, I just really appreciate that. There was cards, there was food, there was money. I mean, Stan wasn't a tither, and he couldn't believe. Somebody gave him $900, and he thought, how could that be? And I thought, that was so cool how God would do that. He'd work on somebody. We needed exactly $900, and that was exactly what we got. And it was anonymous, which was really good because it is good because it's from God. It's not from the person, but God put it on their heart. And um, we got cards, and um, Pastor Roger and Sandy, the love that I've felt from them all through the years, they've always been there for me, and I just appreciate it so much. Um, let me just look at this, see if I got anything else I got to say. I got a lot to say. I'm, I don't want to hog up all the time, but, um, oh, this is the other thing I have to share. Pastor Carol would always pray for me, and she'd always encourage me, and she knew what it was like to be, uh, to be married and not have your husband be there. And um, she would pray for Stan that he would come, and she goes, I don't know, Mary Jo, but all the time when I'm praying, I hear Feller. I hear Feller. And I'm like, she goes, I think um, Kurt Feller, I think it's Kurt Feller, and he's going to minister to Stan. And so I said, okay. But you know, it, it wasn't Kurt Feller. It was Herman Feller. <laughs> And I thank God for Herman Feller. And like Matt said a couple of weeks ago, everybody needs a Herman Feller. You know, Herman has such a heart. And he came and it kind of adopted Stan. And um, Stan loved Herman. And so I just thank you, Herman. Thank you. I thank you, Grace Church. I thank you for this family of God. Um, you know, I have had other issues. And I've, I um, want to just say one thing. And what I think it was Sharon Nafsker said yesterday about if you are lonely, that is the enemy's territory. And I'm, I, I know that I went through something, and the reason why God has you go through things, there's always a treasure on the other side, right? And our testimony, you know what? I was lonely, and I got in a trap, and I got in a relationship that I wasn't supposed to be in. And um, everybody was telling me, but I was so deceived, and I just thought it was from God. I thought it was, and it wasn't. But... Um, I um, was really nervous, and I, I needed to, I, I knew that this was not from God, and I needed out, and I had to humble myself, and I called Pastor Roger, and I told him, I'm sorry, I should, you know, I should have listened to him, he tried to tell me, but I didn't listen, and um, he, he came, he brought me back, I mean, I met him here, and do you know that he loved me, he loved me through it, he did not judge me. And nobody in church judged me, and I had to humble myself. And I came back here, and people loved me. And you know, I just want to thank you. And I was, I didn't know if I should share this, because it's still, it's been seven years. And, uh, but I, what would I have done without the family of God? And you guys love me back. So thank you. And uh, so just share your stuff. <laughs> okay, thanks. Give me a hug. Wow. Wow, praise God. You know, <clears throat> Jesus' prayer to the Father is being answered with these kinds of situations. Remember in 1720, he said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you and I. He's praying for us. I want to read a few more verses along with that. 
Jesus prayer, Holy Father, you've given me your name, now protect them. And again, it wasn't just his disciples then, it was for us. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one. See, that's what's happening here. You feel a oneness with Mary Jo? Right? Right? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <clears throat> all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I'm in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me so they may be one, as we are one. I'm in them and you're in me. May they ex experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Much of the blessing that we are experiencing as a church and even individually and as families is a result of the unity. Psalm 139, I believe it is, it says, that's where I command the blessing, where there's unity. And so the unity is something that we need to pursue and strive for. You know, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we need each other. Again, we've got to get away from the idea of coming to church, of what am I going to get today? It's come here, what am I going to give? Amen? Because the more we give, the more we're going to get. Let me just read this from 1 Corinthians 12. The human body has many parts. How many of you have heard this before? Okay, we don't need to read this then, I guess. Huh? We need to hear it over and over, don't we? The human body has many parts, but many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some Gentiles, some slaves, some free. But we've all been baptized into one body by the Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. Yet the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand. That does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts. Do you understand where we're going with this, where he's going with this? <clears throat> we're many parts. We all have different functions. He's given each of us different gifts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the most honorable parts don't require the special care. So God put his body, put his, God put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. All the members, all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. I found a book that my mother gave to me 58 years ago. How many of you were not alive 58 years ago? <laughs> I was 15, and um, you've perhaps heard of it. <coughs> it's called The Power of Positive Thinking. And you know, uh, Norman Vincent Peale was a, quite an amazing person. And honestly, I don't know for sure, just because a person is clergy, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are born again. Uh, unfortunately, I know a lot of pastors who don't even regard, have any regard for the Bible. But he had a great uh, love for the Bible, and I believe he was born again, just for the record. In any case, she gave me this, and I was at my first year at a new school as a sophomore, and this, I started reading it, and every chapter had things in here referring to Scripture and assignments even. And so I got into it, and I discovered these things worked. For example, 
I was new in the school, didn't know anybody, and I, he had the verse in here and a whole chapter on he that would have friends must show himself to be friendly. I thought, well, that's a good idea. Maybe if I'm friendly with other people, that, and I found that it worked. And on and on, every chapter I found the scriptures worked. That caused me to dig out my Bible that I had from way back in Confirmation and start reading it. And I can remember so well the night, and it was probably in February or March, somewhere around there, that uh, as I was reading it, I sensed the presence of God come into the room. And none of our family were saved. I wasn't saved. Uh, we didn't go to church. But the Holy Spirit guided me through the scriptures of the verses to show me how I could know that I had eternal life. And that was when I actually made my first commitment. I believe I was born again at that point. It was a deeper later on. But in any case, I just share that with you before I read this a couple of pages here. And first of all, let me just read this, because this is significant. This is in the prelude. Vince Appeal says this, I need not point out that the powerful principles contained herein are not my invention, but are given to us by the greatest teacher who ever lived and who still lives. This book teaches applied Christianity, a simple yet scientific system of practical techniques of successful living that works. Now, it may take you a minute to figure out why I'm using this illustration, but it's pretty powerful. And it may have some other messages for some of us as well as I go through it. It's just a couple pages. A man 52 years of age consulted me. He was in great despondency. He revealed utter despair. He said he was all through. He informed me that everything he had built up over his lifetime had been swept away. Everything I asked? Everything, he repeated. He was through, he reiterated. I have nothing left at all. Everything is gone. There is no hope and I'm too old to start over. I've lost all faith. Naturally, I felt sympathetic toward him, but it was evident that his chief trouble was the fact that dark shadows of hopelessness had entered his mind and discolored his outlook, distorting it. Behind this twisted thinking, his true powers and had retreated, leaving him without force. So I said, suppose we take a piece of paper and write down the values you have left. There's no use, he said. I haven't a single thing left. I thought I told you that. I said, well, let's just see anyway. Then I asked, is your wife still with you? Why, yes, of course. And she's wonderful. We have been married 32 years. She would never leave me, no matter how bad things are. All right, let's put that down. Your wife is still with you. She'll never leave you, no matter what happens. How about your children? Do you got any children? Yes, he replied. I have three, and they are certainly wonderful. I've been touched by the way they have come to me. <coughs> and said, Dad, we love you and we'll stand by you. Well, then I said, that's number two, three children who love you and will stand by you. Got any friends, I asked? Yes, he said, I recall. I really have some fine friends. I must admit they've been pretty decent. They have come around and said they would like to help me. But what can they do? They can't do anything. Well, that's number three. You have some friends who would like to help you and who hold you in esteem. How about your integrity? Have you done anything wrong? My integrity is all right, he replied. I've always tried to do the right thing, and my conscience is clear. All right, we'll put that number four, integrity. How about your health? My health is all right, he answered. I've had a few sick days, I guess. I'm in pretty good shape physically. Number five, physical health. How about the United States? Do you think it's still doing business and is the land of opportunity? Yes, it's the only country in the world I would want to live in. That's number six. You live in the United States, land of opportunity, and you're glad to be here. Then how about your religious faith? Do you, have, do you believe in God, that God will help you? Yes, he said, I don't think I could have gotten through all this if I hadn't had some help from God. Now I said, here's a list of assets we figured out. One, a wonderful wife, married 32 years. Two, three devoted children who will stand by you. Three, three friends who will help you and who hold you in esteem. Four, integrity, nothing to be ashamed of. Five, good physical health. Six, the United States, the greatest country in the world. Seven, have religious faith. I shoved the cross table at him. I t said, take a look at that. I guess you have quite a total of assets. I thought you told me had, everything had been swept away. He grinned ashamedly. I guess I didn't think of those things. Never thought of it that way. Perhaps things aren't so bad at all. Maybe I can start over again. If I can just get some confidence, I can get the feel of some power within me. Well, he got it, and he did start over again. But he did so only when he changed his viewpoint, his mental attitude, 
Faith swept away his doubts and more than enough power to overcome all his difficulties emerged from within. The thing, what were the first three things that he listed? His wife, his kids, and friends. Family. That's physical. What I want to relate this to is right here. Every one of us have gone, I don't care if you're 10 years old, you can think of things you've gone through that have been hard. We go through, th I just talked to one of our friends here just a little while ago. Life is hard. Some say life is hard and then you die. <laughs> you know, but life is hard, but it's, I think it was the great philosopher John Wayne said, life is hard, especially if you're stupid. Something like that. <clears throat> don't be stupid. See, we have a family. Some of you don't have any physical family. You know, I visited the, vis the nursing home up here. We, we preach up there occasionally. And I read the statistics and the, uh, just this last week. Six out of ten people in nursing homes in America never have anybody visit them. Never. Think about that. But we're family. And so some of you are alone. Some of you don't have uh, maybe moms or dads left. Or ki Anyhow, the point is, we have each other. God intended for us to truly be a family. And I wish I could... How many of you ever saw the Waltons? The old Waltons movies. See, that was kind of a cool family. I loved the old grandpa. I remember they were trying to... They got him to go to church one time, and he came home and and they said, well, what did he preach on? Well, he preached on sin. Well, what did he say about it? Well, he was against it. And <laughs> but the Waltons would be, you know, good night, John Boy, and all that stuff. Now, that was a great family, but it wasn't a perfect family. I think that we're on our way to becoming a, a better family than the Waltons could ever dream of. And you can see that. You see, I remember very well my sister talking about... <laughs> Mary Jo, praying for her. Lori Wirtz, <coughs> others that she discipled. God is wanting the men of Grace Church to be men of God and be mentors. If you're willing, I had somebody that visited here a week or so ago that called, and they live hour and a half away and they want to know if there's a way that they because I was talking about this is there some way that he, he could come here and be a mentor for one of the young men and I said well that'd be tough this far away and I recommend that a church that's closer to him if there's great joy in that God intends for the men to be mentoring men the women to be mentoring women and the younger ones to be learning how to be mentors God has called all of us to be take what is a mentor Somebody that's sharing the things that they have learned that God has taught them, sometimes the hard way, right? What works and what doesn't work in life. So, okay. Those of you that, how many of you want to share a testimony today? I just want to see if anybody feels strongly about that you want to. I see one, two, <sighs> nuts. <laughs> It's a dilemma because uh, this, this part is kind of special to me that this is just the urgency. See, you can hear all this stuff that you, you can go in one ear and out the other and you walk out and you don't even remember anything that I've said. Unless you put some legs on this thing, unless you do something. God, show me somebody that I can reach out to supernaturally. They, we have the gift of discernment. God can show you somebody that has a need or say, God, bring somebody to me that I can help. Begin to, to let him live through you. That's the urgency. I was going to tell you, and I'll tell you about it. Maybe I'll take a minute next week. John's preaching. But I, uh, there's a new app that I have on my iPhone. I've told a couple of you about it that I just love. And five times a day, this comes up. If you have that picture, go ahead and put it up there. The app is called WeCroak.com. <laughs> And you can get it if you want to. It's not even Christian. But five times a day, this thing goes off, and I look at it, and it says, remember, you're going to die. <laughs> well, how morbid is that? You know what? It's not morbid. I'll tell you why. I'm a pretty good company because, you know, first of all, King David, he said this, remind me, Lord, how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You've made my life no longer than my width of my hand. 
my entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We're merely moving shadows. All our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. And then, you talk about being good company. See, I, I, I'm gonna, when I get a chance, I'm going to read another story in here. You've heard me talk about how I enjoy just going to the cemetery and hanging out. And just, I'm not going to take time to go into it, but I realized now when I got this was 15 years old because one of the advices, one of the, a bit of advice that he gave some, ah, I'm sorry, I haven't got time for all this. <laughs> I know, it's frustrating. Uh, anyhow, David's son, Solomon, what did he say? A wise person thinks a lot about death. Well, I think about it five times a day. And in a little bit, we're going to collect those cards. Just a little bit. Hold on. And actually, I, yeah, we'll get back to that. Um, why is it wise to think about death? God wants us. Jesus came to give us the abundant life. The only way you're going to experience the abundant life is if your focus on your life is on letting him live through you. Literally, let it, giving your life to him. Present your body a living sacrifice to God. From this point on, every day, from the time I get up until I go to bed, would you just live through me and love through me? Show me what you see. Help me to feel what you feel and do what you do. <clears throat> okay. You guys have four seconds apiece. No. <laughs> All right, who is first over here? Rachel. Uh, those of you that want to share that raise your hands, come and sit right here real quick. Regarding those cards, regarding the cards, I think what I'm going to do I'm not going to pass the bucket around. We're going to leave it back there. You can put them in. Hey, no, we got to collect them. Yeah, we got to collect them. Go ahead and pass the bucket around. Collect all those cards. Again, it's optional. Fold it in two one time. And yeah, pass them to the center of the aisles, and they'll collect them. And then as you leave today, if you put one in, you can take one out. You take it home. Let's believe, let's believe for some testimonies next week of some of these miracles taking place in different lives. Amen? Rachel. All right, I will be quick, um, but in regards to mentorship and thankfulness, um, so I have been going to this church as of this fall for 10 years, um, and uh, this is my, these last few weeks, my first weeks back in a year, and um, you had mentioned a couple weeks ago about having that one person that you can call no matter what or go to no matter what, and she won't hear it. Um, but April Stevenson has been that one person for me for a couple of years now, and I probably would not be here today if it was not for her. Um, but also in the last few weeks, there have been several women that God has brought back into my life from this church um, that have been um, praying for me and words of encouragement and um, mentoring me in many different ways and areas of my life, and I'm just thankful. Well, I've thought of Grace Church as my family for many years now, and they really are, um, in addition to Jesus, being the center of my life. And a couple of weeks ago at the quickening, I did something really stupid and fell down and broke my wrist. And from the moment that happened, I have received nothing but kindness. The, um, Scott Stevenson was one of those there that helped me uh, figure out I needed to go to the hospital, and um, that night, um, Pastor Roger and Sandra stopped by even though they were so tired and I had just been treated with kindness from medical people and from the people in this church from the one who comes over and opens a can of cat food for me and um, my two, two of my friends last week cleaned up my yard. People have been just plain kind and just loving towards me and have taught me things that I needed to learn about kindness and caring for others. And I think that's the, the greatest thing that I've gotten out of this is how to, to have mercy and compassion for other people. Thank you all. Do you have a cat? Oh. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Actually, I'd like for you to share more sometime. Seriously, because you've been here a while, and you have a much more of a story than, than just that. All right, was there someone else that I missed? Okay, we're two minutes after. Did I? Oh, come on up, Greg. Come on up. 
And I just want to remind you folks, this is really important to sign up out there. There's three different things, ringing the bells, the Christmas party, and what's the third one? Thanksgiving dinner, yes. Or sign up for uh, um, decorating too. So, Greg, my friend. Already. I just want to thank everybody, um, the family of God. Uh, Wanda and I have been through a lot lately. You know, I, um, last or four weeks ago, she was in a bad crash. And, um, you know, the, the police officer came up to her and on the crash thought that, you know, she was gone until they seen her chest moving. And they um, brought out the um, Calvary to, uh, to um, get her out of the car. She was cut out of the car with the jaws of life. Thank God for the creator of the jaws of life because um, that person has saved a lot of people's lives with God's help, obviously. And, um, you know, through it all, I, I feel that um, God has helped me to, um, to learn so that if this ever happens to somebody else, you know, the trouble that we've been through, that I can help. You know, I can, I'm a police officer. Um, the job calls you, it's not the other way around. And I'm a servant to everybody. You know, I serve the community. But, um, you know, you, you think, man, things can't get any worse and a lot of bad things happen. But there's a lot of good that comes out of it too, you know. I, I learned that, you know, I still have a wife here today. I could be sitting here alone. You know, I learned how lucky I am to um, have the people who have the skill and the knowledge to get her out of that car safely so she didn't get banged up anymore. Um, I've learned to appreciate my um, kids and my grandkids. Um, as you know, um, Noah was shot in, in, in uh, January um, with a 22 rifle, and um, we went through all that process. Um, and you ask, why do these things keep happening? Why, why, why? Um, and, and I don't have a lot of good answers for that, other than I'm learning a lot. Some stuff I don't want to learn, but I, I guess, uh, you know, there's a reason for it. But um, all in all, you know, the, the body of um, Christ has been helping my family. You know, they brought in food when Wanda couldn't cook because she had the vertigo and all the stuff that involved that crash, with that crash. Just so you know, she was stopped. And she was hit at 65 miles an hour in the rear end of her car. The left rear tire was pushed right up against her seat. They literally cut her piece by piece out of that car. And, um, and she survived. You know, that's an absolute miracle of God. I, I believe that there's guardian angels there taking care of her every moment. I found out later, you know, three hours later, that, that um, you know, she was in the ER and she had blacked out. Um, and um, she had blood on her um, brain and a lot of bad things were happening real fast. But the skilled people who are involved and, and God's hand on, him, on them and the jaws of life um, spared her. So I have her um, today and um, I'm blessed to call her my wife and the family of God to be there for me when we've needed it so bad. So thank you so much and thank you Lord for everything you're doing for the church and and us too. Amen. And this is Wanda's first time in church since all that. Welcome, Wanda. <laughs> well, I want to dismiss you with this Moses prayer. The more I, I read this and use it, the more I feel... This is something that is obvious. This is the word of God, and I believe there's power in it. And so I'd like for you to stand. I'd like to just pray this prayer over you. Receive this. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen.